There we go. Hey, <coughs> welcome to Etsy. Or welcome to episode one seventeen of TGIK. This episode is going to be us digging in to Etsy. How it works, what it does, some of the topologies for how um, it's spun up inside of Kubernetes clusters. We're going to look at uh, all kinds of interesting uh, models here, and I'm going to share with you a lab environment that I built um, that you can run locally on your machine to uh, to do some of this modeling yourself. So let's see who we've got signed in here. Oh wow, got to scroll back a little bit. All right, so we got Mr. Steve Wade is hanging out with us from London. How are you doing, Mr. Steve? Good to see you. Philip Nelson saying hello. Joy from Richmond, Virginia. Good to see you, Joy. Lamati saying. <coughs> Everybody rocks. I'm, I'm so glad to see you, Lamati, and gl glad to see everybody else. Um, thanks for calling this out, because it was definitely one of the things I wanted to dig into, and I just hadn't, like, uh, I hadn't actually scheduled an episode for it, so good point calling this one out. We got Sunny Kumar saying hello. Rory from Lock Goyle Head. I can, never say, I can never say that name, but it's always good to see you, Rory. Sig Honk represent, which is kind of a, a group of security-minded individuals. We got <coughs> Cherry saying hello and Z saying hello, and Jeremy from saying uh, asking what the topic is. So yeah, the topic, what, like the overall outline of the episode, is going to be available at um, uh, tgik.io slash notes, and this is what I'm planning on covering. Um, but and these are just like little quick notes, just to remind myself like where I am in the narrative. But like if you have things or questions that you'd like to ask or things you want to make sure that we cover or you know use cases and stuff that you're concerned about just make sure you throw them in here and then I'm happy to like dig into them and, and talk about how they work um, but this is usually just me like brain dumping a particular component of Kubernetes uh, as it relates and we are outside yeah I'm, I'm hanging out in my backyard this beautiful backyard I love it um, it's a tremendous place to be who else do we have we got Brendan saying hello from Seattle. We got some hellos from Sweden. Good to see you. We got some hellos from Denmark and from Boston. We have somebody signing in from India. Ishwar, good to see you. And Ali from Sweden. Uh, Ansu from Paris. Bogdan saying hello from Bucharest, Romania. Romania. I'm from Israel. Mr. Steve Sloka saying hello. Mr. Tim Carr also. Cornelia Davis saying hello from Santa Barbara. Good to see you, Cornelia. And Morteza from Tehran. Waleed saying hello. Happy TGIK to everybody. And David. Yeah, <laughs> Cooper Gardening. True, right? Yeah, I love it. AJ from San Jose. It's probably hotter where you are, AJ. Like up here in Alameda, it's not so bad. <coughs> um, fully Geared Bear from Portugal. And Armin from Ar Amsterdam. Marcin from Cacao. Saleh, looking forward to the, dig di the deep dive, and David from Medbury, uh, David Medbury from Colorado. I think there might actually be a Medbury in Colorado. I don't know why my brain was doing that. And Tunde saying hello. Good to see you, Tunde. And Philip, and Tiffany, and Emerkin, and Alessio, and Phil, and AJ, and Shubham, and Z from San Francisco, and Balas from Hungary. It's good to see you all. I just love how this is such a global audience, and it's just a great time to kind of like sit and geek out about some stuff. So I'm glad you're all here to, to hang out with me. So that said, let's dig into what's happening in the ecosystem this week. Remember, uh, I've, I've pointed you in this direction before, but I'm going to go ahead and whoop, kick over to the screen and face. All right, cool. And then we can click over to, oh, there we go. All right, <clears throat> so I've pointed you in this direction before, but a, your reminder that there are a couple of really great places to get some information about what's happening in the ecosystem. LWKD.info uh, is a great place to, if you're interested in what's happening with the, uh, within the, um, uh, the code base for Kubernetes. And uh, as an example, for the week of May 3rd, we've got a, um, uh, next deadline is the enhancement freeze happening on May 19th, and then there's some featured PRs which are always pretty interesting, and they're pretty well. Um, uh, it, usually, the stuff that shows up here is definitely stuff worth tracking if you're interested in the code base of what's happening inside the code base of Kubernetes. So, like this is a great resource if you're looking to understand a little more about what's happening there. Um, the other one this week that, that's useful is TGIK or sorry, K8's Weekly. Cube Weekly. Weekly. Yeah, cubeweekly.io. And this one is curated by 
<coughs> some of them, some of the awesome um, uh, spokespersons for Kubernetes. I can't think of the term right now, but like, you know, the folks who are like out there uh, talking about uh, CNCF ambassadors for Kubernetes. That's what I was looking for. And they uh, and they and they curate this list every week, and it's actually pretty decent uh, every week. So this week on the podcast from Google is Helm talking, to Matt Butcher talking about Helm, which ought to be a pretty good, interesting conversation. Um, a lot of us are carrying baggage around Helm over time, but like really, you gotta you gotta stop and take a good cold look at where it is today, right? I mean, like Helm three is a big change, and it's definitely worth like you know considering again. Then we got. U.S. Department of Defense enabling DevSecOps on F-16s and battleships. Sounds like an action-packed article. We got In Case You Missed It webinars, including one that I was a part of or that I was able to ask questions. I don't see it here, though. That's interesting. So there was a webinar that I did with, um, or that I was, I participated in with a couple of great folks, including our good, our, our good friend George, about uh, how to present a really good OBS-based um, webinar. And so, like, we covered that. You can catch that probably in the in the backdrop, but there's always webinars happening in the CNCF webinars. It's always good stuff. So these are both great resources to see what's happening weekly, and then we usually curate a list and kind of like hit the stuff that we think um, kind of caught our eye, uh, including that K8 119 Alpha 3 is here, um, and you can see the changes since the last Alpha, and they also call out a really important pro tip. And I, I talked a little bit about this on Twitter this week, but um, <clears throat> making sure you check the deprecations. And so it's also important that we understand and have a common agreement about what deprecation means. Like deprecation in this context means that the uh, that, that particular resource is marked deprecated in favor of another resource, but it's not removed from the API server yet. Right? So there's a period of uh, there's a period of compatibility in which we're able to um, we're still able to use what's there. Until the neck until the until the uh, the version that will remove it and so API extensions k 8io b1 beta 1 uh, API registration and authentication these are all moving um, and as of 119 they will have they will be available at that new path right um, but as of 122 they will no longer be served at the old path and so there's there's a level uh, there's there's a period of support so making sure that you're all aware of that and how that works Steve did a meetup on Metal's journey toward throwaway clusters. I love that topic. That's pretty awesome. And it's on YouTube. Somebody give me the, put the link into the to the notes, y'all. And Steve Wade has updated his version of deprecation. That's good. I wonder actually if the one what is that one? Pluto. I wonder if Pluto has uploaded updated. Let's let's take a look real quick. Fairwinds Ops Pluto is a great little open source tool. They actually just announced it pretty recently. It looks like we're getting updates. Yeah. So Pluto is another one of the tools out there. Commits. That, um, I think is actually, uh, folks are trying to like make it so that it's supportable. I don't yet see this, oh, there we go. Adding the one. Uh, Mr. Steve Wade. Look at that. Not only is he on top of it, he's adding the 119 deprecations to Pluto. And he's saying that right here in the chat. So very good to see you, sir. That's awesome. Open source contribution. Rec represent. It's tremendous. Glad to see you out there. <coughs> um, what else are we going to cover? So there's also some pretty interesting articles. One of, uh, one of my favorite topics is kind. Y'all have heard me talk about this all the time. Uh, I probably gets a little irritating hearing me talk kind up, but you know, we're gonna be playing with it again today. And it is what it is. But this one is interesting because it's about running kind inside a Kubernetes cluster for continuous integration. So if the resource you have at your disposal is a Kubernetes cluster, how can you, uh, you know, handle continuous integration where kind is the destination for your tests. And this one was really well written. It's by GU and Steve Jung. <coughs> and this is uh, basically documenting like how some of the challenges that they ran into it and to uh, in basically nesting kind inside of Kubernetes um, at D2IQ. So definitely worth checking out. They call out some really interesting problems. Things like making sure that you have the MTU set correctly, 
the PID1 problem. Uh, if you're not familiar with containerization too much, this is a this is a problem that has been haunting us for years. You know, but basically, we need to make sure that we have a way of managing the um, PID1. And, the, and like, like I said, the TLDR version of the PID1 problem is that if you're running everything inside of a container and you send a kill or um, a sig hub to the first process in that container or the running process inside that container, how do you ensure that all of the child processes are also reaped? And this is where one of the problem, one of the ways to, to solve that problem is this teeny um, init system that they're, they're calling out. But there are other tools out there as well. And we're going to play with that a little bit today. So C group mounts, which is basically making sure that you have a place to actually have the C group defined. <coughs> um, it's interesting, they didn't, call, they didn't run into the file system problem that I ran into. Um, but I guess, you know, like it, it's working for them. So yeah, lots of really interesting details, lots of interesting things to think about when you're trying to deal with um, running kind inside of another, inside of a Kubernetes pod. So kind inside of, kind inside of, I mean, you could go several layers deep. I think you'd probably run out of I notify watches before anything else happened, but you get the idea. Kind of neat stuff. All right, what else do we got? Checking in with the chat. Carlos Santana saying, I saw that today. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Kind is awesome. Steve saying, Alex, here, just, just why? Because you can, Alex. Because it's fun to like, you know, point the mirrors at each other and see and see what shakes out. Now, really though, it's, uh, it's for CI, right? So like, say you're developing an operator and your environment is, and your environment and what you're doing, your builds and your tests are gonna be like um, places where you're, um, where, where you're going to want to do all of your testing. So in your CI environment, like you might spin up a kind cluster and then deploy that operator and then run your integration tests against that operator and making sure that it's going to work. Um, but you don't want to do that against a production cluster. So how do you handle that sort of thing? And this is one of the, one of the use cases for it. There is an, a new write-up on pod security policies. And I love that the first topic in the write-up is why bother? And it's true, like, you know, pod security policies are a really good idea. They talk about, like, why they're a good idea, how to do them. They give you some examples. Wow, they really go into it. Require drop capabilities. That's actually a really good set of drop capabilities. Turn off net broadcast, all kinds of things. And some of these are actually turned off by default, weirdly enough, but, yeah. Sysboot. Want to turn that off. And then the volumes that you're going to allow access to, right? So config map, downward API, empty deer, projected, secret. Notice that there are no, oh, there we go. So persistent volume claims, if you want to enable persistent volume claims. This is a very restrictive policy that we're looking at here. Host PID, host network, rule, must run as. I don't see must, where is it at? Uh, I'm actually kind of surprised that, um, I see. Rule must run as. So disallow root. So basically you're, you're enforcing that the container has to run as root. So that's pretty good. But basically allowing any, any UID outside of zero to basically match. And that's good. Host IPC false. Yeah, this is a very good restrictive policy. I can tell they put some work into that one. Um, and then how to apply the policies. like. And basically talking about the way that pod security policies are consumed. And this one is interesting because they're enabling this policy. They're, allow they're allowing access to this policy to system authenticated, which is like everybody, including uh, service accounts. And then if you had a more specific one ah okay boy you know every time I click on this it highlights it all and makes it go away so it's a little hard to read but anyway so this is actually kind of a, a way of providing an exception right so in this case they're allowing fluent D to do things that maybe not the general use inside the cluster can do and the neat thing about this is that they're um, associating a role binding bound to the FluentD namespace tied to the um, service account that FluentD will use 
And this is and that relationship with the service count on Fluent D is how the the um, Fluent D pods, as long as they're actually mounted within that, as long as they're mounted with that particular service count, are getting access to use the pod security policy that they've defined for Fluent D. The access model for pod security policies is a little complex, but this is one way to solve it. It's probably the most granular way. Another way to solve it would be to actually bind the um, the uh, do a role binding within the namespace of group service accounts, any system service accounts, um, to the particular pod security policy, and that way you don't you don't actually have to tie it to um, the specific uh, service accounts into the namespace. You can also tie it to the uh, service accounts associated with things like the controller manager, right? So where you have like the replica set controller, you can bind it to that, and then when the replica set controller creates pods, it will have access to the, the pod security policies that are that are bound within that namespace. Interesting stuff. When they have troubleshooting and triage, this is a really good write-up. So great job, Jason Price. If you're interested in pod security policies, this is a really solid write-up. Um, but if you are interested in pod security policies, you should probably also be interested in things like um, OPA and those sorts of things, because it's likely that pod security policies will eventually get moved out of <coughs> the configuration and into, um, oh wow, typo, into uh, third-party things like um, OPA's gatekeeper stuff. OpenShift has SCC. I wonder if OPA will be something to bring you. Yeah, I think that's the goal, is to make it unify on, on stuff like OPA gatekeeper. The challenge, of course, is that like in some of the more restrictive environments, like that means that you have another third party, um, another third party tool that you have to require um, be deployed on all clusters, and that's that's a hard one. Agreed, Ryan, and that's a good question, and it's one that we're still battling with. But I don't know that there's a good clean answer there. If you're interested in this topic, though, I would definitely recommend jumping into um, the Sig Auth community meetings and uh, bringing it up and driving it. I know that we're looking for people to help drive the, the direction of where this is actually going to go. So, very good point. Yeah, that's a good one too. Uh, the other one is, uh, for Blas, it's actually, it's interesting. You, you bring up the cube system one because that actually highlights another little quirk in the way that pod security policies work. And here is a, a trivia question from my amazing audience. Are you ready? The question is, Say you're going to bring up a cluster with kubeadm, and kubeadm brings up the control plane with, as static pods. Now, <coughs> say you wanted to grant access to the pod security policies that allow for those restricted for those mirror pods to be registered with the cluster, so that when um, when the kubelet tries to register that pod, it's a, it is able to uh, register the pod because the pod security policy allows it. What would you do? Like, how do you grant access such that um, that that can happen? Anybody know? Anybody have any ideas? It's kind of a fun one. Think about who is defining the pod in that case, because it's not the user. Who is defining the pod? And when that pod is uh, defined, like, how would you grant access to that to that entity to? Uh, have access to that pod security policy. The kubelet! Yeah! It's actually, the kubelet's authentication piece is actually part of a group called System Nodes. It is the kubelet, yeah. And so basically it's the node itself. The node authorizes with its own key. And so the system node, the group System Nodes is actually where you would grant that access. You would grant access to that pod security policy to system nodes in the namespace, in the, um, in the cube system namespace. And then when the kubelet tried to register that mirror pod with the API server, it would authenticate as a part of the system nodes group and it would be able to, um, to make that happen. So good to see you. I'm glad how many people got that right. That was awesome. <coughs> and there's another article by Povilas, oh, I caught the typo. <coughs> Helm and customize better together. I agree with this, but I think it's I think it's hard sometimes to to to, to think about generally when you're thinking about templating applications. And this is actually the sort, you know, the basis of a couple of the last two episodes that Brian Lyles was doing around um, how to manage things like 
how do you deploy an app? Like, what are your concerns? What are the things you're thinking about? So if you're interested in this sort of a topic, definitely check out those last couple episodes. Brian is tremendous, and he covers a lot of what he thinks about um, around this sort of stuff. So in this case, they're talking about how, we, how you would leverage Helm and Helm 3, and how you can effectively do a thing like templating, where you end up with a whole bunch of YAML that has been templated from your Helm recipe. And then once you have that YAML, can you also then use customize to modify or, or change the, um, the values uh, on a per cluster basis. And actually what's interesting is that this has actually been implemented in a couple of different places. It's, Im it's implemented as part of Flux. It's also implemented as part of um, Argo CD. Uh, the idea that you could actually have like Git GitOps based um, configuration on your clusters, right? In which you have some operator running inside your cluster, whether that's Argo CD or um, Flux, and it would pull the resources, maybe a Helm chart, down from your Git repository and then manipulate that to make it cluster specific inside the cluster itself and then apply those resources directly against that cluster. Right? So customize is a part of that recipe here. But I think in this case it's interesting because they're, they're talking about how you would leverage this thing uh, inside of the, um, inside of your, like, maybe like your CI push flow rather than a pull flow, sort of flipping the model around a little bit. Pretty cool stuff though. Definitely worth checking out. How are we doing with the audience? Red Hat has moved away from Ansible in their open data hub, OpenShift to custom. Oh, that's interesting. Cool, I didn't know that. Thank you for sharing that, Willie. Paul C, Helm supports a new post render flag. So Helm, oh really? See, this is why I like doing this because I learn stuff every week. Mr. Steve Wade will be talking about Customize next week on a webinar with Weaveworks. And he's going to put the link to that webinar into our notes. Right, Steve? Right, right. I like Go templating. I like a lot of things, you know, but it's really just about, like, what you're comfortable with and what is going to be useful for you, right? Like, I think that there's a lot of opportunity to, to get this done. Oh, hey. He actually also calls out basically what I just called out. It's all right here. Wow. Steve, like, did you co did you go stop? Did you go straight this article? No, I'm kidding. Basically, talking about like how you handle secrets. Uh, although in this case, I don't think he gets into that too much. He is asking for help. Yeah, like the whole flux model that um, Steve wrote up in his article would be a, a good one on that. Yeah. Awesome. All right. <clears throat> well, I think that's the community stuff. Let's go into the fun part. Oh, I meant to put that on window one. Boop. All right, this week. Now, remember, I just want to I want to point out that I'm going to put this stuff into. Um, let me show you where I'm going to put it. In fact, uh, just real quick. So, if you go to GitHub.com. You go to VMware, Tanzu, and you go to TGIK. This is going to be, I uh, know, yeah, whatever. This is going to be the directory where we keep TGIK. And as a reminder, if you have uh, episode ideas, feel free to throw them into, um, feel free to throw them into the issues here, right? And we try to pick an episode. I've, I've been actually just kind of like going in my own direction with the TGIK grokking stuff. But whenever we're like trying to figure out what we're going to do next, it's great to actually have um, uh, this list of episodes that we can come back to and look into. Now, some of these we've covered and just haven't closed, but there are a few others here that are definitely worth digging into. But we also have an episodes directory in which you can find uh, content related to things that we've done in the past, right? So here is the content. This is basically the show notes from uh, episode 115. And if you go back to, I think it's like the... Yeah, so here is uh, Kubernetes Secrets Take 3. This is the one that Josh Rosso put out, and he put in his examples of the diagrams that he put in, and also the vault examples, right? So, uh, and, and what I'm going to do at the end of this episode is I'm going to upload a 117 episode directory where all of the resources that I walk you through in this episode are going to be available to you there. So if you're interested in it um, after that and you want to like kind of reproduce what I do inside this episode, this is where you would go to do that. And that's generally our pattern for those sorts of things. 
Yeah, exactly. Violent issue if it's something you want. We do scrub it. Hey, Chris. Good to see you. That'd be interesting, Tim Downey. Um, what else? What else? What else? Uh, all right, cool. So let's get into it. So here's what I built for today's uh, example, right? So first, I wanted to show you uh, a, a really kind of neat tool called Footloose, and here is what Footloose is. So if we go to WeaveWorks, it's a really cool tool that effectively kind of solves an interesting problem uh, in that it creates containers that look like virtual machines, and you can create. Oh, sorry, and you can create um, uh, clusters doing that, right? And so it's actually super interesting stuff, right? So with, with uh, and we're going to leverage this today in this episode, but with, um, but with Footloose, I can create uh, groups of nodes that are brought up on some base image. And my, in most of my examples, I'm going to be leveraging Ubuntu 18.04. And then now that we have um, containers that are running a, an actual um, Ubuntu operating system, we can put stuff onto those things, right? And so in my lab, I've got that set up. Let's take a look at the Footloose YAML. I've got that set up here. I've defined a cluster, a top-level cluster object. I've given it the name etcd, and I've defined a, pri a private key. And part of Footloose's magic is that it will generate this private key and use that private key and populate that private key into, the, um, into roots uh, authorized keys on all of the nodes that you define for the cluster. And that's pretty neat. Further down, we can see uh, I've created a couple of different uh, machine sets. And so kind of a term similar to the way that we think about cluster API, right? I have three replicas of this particular spec, right? I'm telling it to use a backend Docker. Why is there a backend field, you might say? Because you could also use Firecracker, which how cool is that? So in this configuration, I'm using Docker as a backend, but you could also use Firecracker as a backend and create VMs instead of creating, um, yes, we do still want that, Steve. Yes, we do. Um, and you could create uh, uh, virtual machines using KVM or Firecracker to actually handle this stuff. So pretty cool. Here's the image that I'm going to use. And then you can see it's actually pretty flexible. Um, with the most recent version of Kind, Kind now puts all of its nodes inside of a Kind network. So it's not using the default Docker bridge anymore. It's created a new bridge called Kind, and it's putting all of the nodes in there. And so uh, because I'm actually going to stand up an etcd cluster and use that etcd cluster as a backing for kind, I needed to make sure that they were able to reach each other. And due to the isolation that Docker does automatically between networks, I just decided to put these nodes into the kind, um, into that kind network, and that way they can all just intercommunicate. And crazy things like short DNS names and all of that stuff will work. So Rob, good to see you. And we also have the ability to mount in volumes, right? So in these, I'm actually creating an etcd cache, and this is actually going to be where we actually host the etcd uh, bits. And then we also create a shared directory that I'm mounting in, and that's actually going to where, where I'm mounting in things like etcd ADM, which is a tool we'll talk about also, um, and some of those things. Cornelia has a question. One of the insanely cool things is that you can, that, is that when you are using actual VMs, yeah, exactly. True. I really dig it. It's it's a really cool tool. Um, so I've created three different replica sets, if you will, right? I've created one for etcd, and so and you can see in the name I'm actually templating member. So I'll have three members of an etcd cluster: uh, member zero, member one, member two, and then I've also created a load balancer. That's where the load balancer name is, but I've only got one of those, and it'll be lb zero. And then I've also created proxy. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more, more about what that means here in a minute. But what this is doing will be fun. We're going to get to that here in a bit. But you can see it has the same mounts as all the other etcd stuff. Footloose source is at weaveworks. Is at weaveworks slash footloose on GitHub. So, let's play with this stuff. So, to get this turned on, I can just do we, uh, footloose create. And it will presume that footloose.yaml is located locally right here in the directory that I'm operating footloose from. And it creates a bunch of nodes. <coughs> First, it created my SSH key, my cluster key. And then it made sure that the Docker image I need is actually pulled. And it is already. 
and then it just basically created the the members right so now i have my etcd member zero etcd member one etcd member two and then i have uh the um, etcd lb0 and the etcd proxy and i like that they also in their logging call out that it's connected to the kind network how cool is that so then uh, if i do docker ps i can see all of those nodes located and the way that footloose works if i do uh, ssh add cluster key then i can do ssh i can do root uh, sorry footloose ssh root at uh, hmm, member zero and that will get me right into that node and so it'll look and feel just like a regular node right system ctl status system ctl works there's really nothing running on this box so far um journal kettle minus fl right so i've got journal kettle all the things actually uh, kind of work the way that you would expect now, obviously some piece, pieces have been stripped out but I can do app update. I have all of that, all of that kind of neat stuff happening. So, um, and in the in the source of Footloose, they also describe like how to build images. So, if you wanted to actually um, customize this by pre-installing a bunch of packages or anything else like that, that's all covered in the Footloose docs. I'm not going to explore it here. But what I did is I also explored this Ansible example. Let's take a look at that. Cat inventory ML. and so oop, sorry about that so in my inventory I've actually got my members I've got my uh, etcd member 0 1 and 2 I'm using the ansible connection equals docker which tells ansible to docker exec into these things uh, for any um, manipulation of the actual node I've created an all group I've created an LB node I've created an LB group and I've created some etcd members and then I just kind of, you know, horsing around over the week, I kind of played a little bit with building a playbook for this stuff. And so, again, this is all going to be uploaded. I put a common role in here, and I put an HA proxy role in here because we're going to play with the idea of the etcd cluster being behind a load balancer. And I also put an etcd role in here, and then that was kind of fun to build, so we'll talk through that real quick. And in this etcd role, I'm, I'm able to get away with uh, a lot because I'm actually assuming the configuration of the mounts and stuff, right? And so in this case, I don't have to copy in the CATGZ or the, the CA certs. I can assume that they're already part of the shared directory that I've built here. And th these are all going to be uploaded. And so because, uh, actually, before we get into this, we should talk about etcd ADM. So let's do that. ADM. sigs.k8.io etcd adm if you go to sigs.k8.io slash etcd adm you can find a, a project that we're working on in upstream um, and it's not getting a lot of love right now but it's it's up there like some of the more recent commits were from like three months three or four months ago um, and there was a thing i had to fix and and we'll test to see if that my fix worked but what etcd adm uh, tries to do is basically provide some uh, provide a binary that like wraps the ability to manage the membership of all of the members of etcd and this isn't the for only thing that does it out there like there's there's also another one by a friend named quentin quentin machu etcd cloud operator that's another really interesting project out here the quentin quentin m's etcd cloud operator but the, the goal of this is basically to make it so that you can, from the individual node, or from the uh, particular etcd node, um, have some tool that abstracts away some of the complexity of configuration of etcd. Uh, in that you could have things like, you could bring up a single etcd member, and then from another compute node, basically bring a, you know, deploy all the things necessary to deploy etcd again, on that node and just point to that first node and all of the join commands and all of that other stuff will just be worked out for you. So it greatly simplifies the management stuff. And the entity cloud operator piece this is actually kind of interesting. He builds context for what the nodes are leveraging a, an auto scaling group in AWS. In my case, I'm not actually making, I'm, I'm not making the, that assumption, right? In my case, my join command, I have to know where at least one member is or where the load balancer for things are. And so we're going to explore that a little bit in the lab as well. 
So that brings us back to this, and this is where basically I'm running the etcd ADM command, doing exactly what we were talking about before, right? So I have a load balancer configured, and that's where etcd LB0 comes in. Um, and I'm actually leveraging uh, etcd ADM to init etcd on member 0. <coughs> I'm pointing the join command, I'm, I'm adding uh, as an extra SAN the etcd LB0 hostname, and that's because. Um, by default, uh, etcd ADM will only uh, encode into the server certificate the host name that etcd ADM is running on. But because I'm going to put this behind a load balancer also, I needed to include the host name for that load balancer or the certificates won't match and things will fail. And we're going to kind of explore that stuff live as we get into it. And then on the other members, I'm doing the same command, but I'm joining to the load balancer and I'm again encoding in the X XCD LB0. So pop quiz, if I have a load balancer, why am I encoding into the server certificate on each member the host name for the load balancer? Does anybody have any ideas? I'll come back to that one. But in the meantime, let's kick off this thing. So Ansible, Playbook, Playbook Mammal, <coughs> TLS, yes, because LBs authenticate to each other. No, there's only one LB, and there's and I'm not doing anything on TLB on on TLS inside the LB. That was a really unsubtle hint. The LB is the endpoint, yes. But why do I need the SAN on the server certificate? Bum bum bum. This is actually kind of an important question because it makes you think about where I'm terminating TLS. It's an L4 proxy. Yes, exactly. I'm just using HA proxy to handle the transport piece. I'm not terminating TLS on HA proxy. I'm terminating TLS back on the nodes, right? And so because of that, I need to make sure that um, the backend node uh, has that host name as part of its server certificate, or TLS won't terminate on that node. So if you think about that as a diagram, basically my client will go to the load balancer, LB0, and that will then go to one of the member. And <coughs> the difference, instead of actually doing uh, TLS and then re-encrypt, Instead of doing something like this, which is a pretty common model, where the client terminates TLS on the load balancer, and then we re-encrypt back to the back end, right, to that, to that etcd member, I'm not doing that. I've gotten rid of TLS up here, and I've moved TLS termination down to the actual node. So in that case, what's happening is that the transport, just the, it's just the... Um, I'm just literally switching the TCP session. I'm not doing anything with the. Uh, I'm not doing anything with the um, uh, the actual application layer at HA proxy. So now I've got all that configured, and you know, it's kind of neat because it's Ansible, and I think I think it's a requirement that if you're showing off Ansible, you show off that it's idempotent. I've made it so that it's idempotent. All of these things will come back green because nothing had to change. Ooh. And that actually highlights one of the other kind of gotchas that I had to fix. This is kind of a fun one. So you can see that nothing else had to change, and that's actually kind of neat. Um, just making it idempotent. So as an example, if you're interested in that kind of thing, definitely check it out. Kind of cool. So one of the other things I had to fix, which was kind of interesting, uh, was the resolution stuff. So these nodes that, uh, that uh, Footloose brings up are uh, dual stack because my underlying host is dual stack and the and so the containers that are started on that are also dual stack. And what that means is that um, by default, uh, we will try to resolve uh, an IPv6 name before trying to resolve an IPv4 name. So your system resolvers, right, if I do host, google.com 
it'll try to resolve the IPv6 name before it tries to resolve the IPv4 name. And that broke some things uh, inside of my etcd cluster. In fact, it took me a little while to figure this out. Um, in that if I uh, jump into my LB0 here, if I were to do host etcd uh, let's see, member zero, Big? Yeah, too good. Apt update. Apt install hosts. What was interesting <coughs> was that it was resolving, um, the resolver by default was resolving this IP address first, as opposed to resolving the IPv4 address first. And so what was happening was inside of my etcd uh, HA proxy HA proxy configuration, because I'm using a host name to define the back end so that I don't have to care about the IP addressing, I had to actually make it so that that host name would resolve to an IPv4 address so it would actually terminate on the IPv4 address that is used inside of my etcd member. Uh, otherwise, what happened? Well, otherwise, it was actually failing to terminate because it was resolving to IPv6, and etcd by default was binding to only IPv4. So, kind of interesting stuff. Is there a particular need for IPv6? No, there is not a, a particular. I mean, kind of trippy. How did I do it? So, I changed that by. Good question. Thank you for getting me back on topic. Uh -oh. See what? No. Oh. So, I changed that by populating guy.conf or gay.com, you know, whatever you want to call it. And I basically set the precedence for IPv6 addresses to 100, which meant that the, by default, the precedence for IPv4 resolution is higher. Um, basically tricking the system resolver in glibc and everywhere else to, to resolve IPv4 over IPv6. By default, if you have a dual stack node, it will try to resolve IPv6 over IPv4. And in some cases, especially in cases like this, that can break stuff because you don't really have a way of, uh, like maybe if your upstream DNS res uh, or IPv6 resolvers are broken, or maybe you don't actually have a path to IPv6 addresses. So you can resolve those IPv6 hosts, but you can't access them. This is a system level way of fixing the problem. And if you want to look into what that means, uh, infoguy.com. Eh. And .com. On a host that actually has manual files, you can you can dig it you can dig into what this means. But basically, it's configuring the get adder info function, and and it's configuring it system wide. And so you can set precedence, and you can uh, dig into it and like you know pretty cool stuff. But yeah, so that's how I did that. Uh, that was your deep magic tip for the week. So here's our etcd lab again. Now we've got all that set up. So we have our cluster. Let's go ahead and build our kind cluster and talk about how that works. All right, fine. We could, yes. But I liked the guy thing better. because, Like, I don't want to disable IPv6. That seems a little harsh. I just wanted to resolve IPv4 over the IPv6 addresses. I'm just kidding. Anyway, so let's play with it some more. So now we have our uh, etcd cluster up. And we can jump into one of our nodes, docker exec ti etcd member zero, bash, and then part of etcd adm, shared etcd adm help, are you have these different commands, right? You have a join command, which we saw in our um, Ansible script. We have our init command, and we're going to play with these also. But let, in fact, let's play with one now. So <coughs> you have join, init, and reset, and, and these are some of the ones we're going to be playing with, right? And so in our case, we want to go ahead and uh, first we're going to see if etcd operated. So if we do opt bin etcd ctl sh member list, we can see all three of our members, 1802, 1803, 1804, and they're just re re uh, registered with their IPv4 address. This was the problem. Right, because these are registering with IPv4 and not IPv6, I needed to make it so that the load balancer was actually accessing them on IPv4. That was that's how, and that was how I chose to do it. Um, but the cluster is up, so the next thing I want to do is I want to remove member zero from the from the set and show how that works, and kind of talk about why etcd ADM is so cool, and then we'll get into the fun stuff of actually bringing up an etcd cluster and talking about how all of that stuff works. 
Um, so, Docker exec ti member one bash. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove this member and we'll talk about the magic of etcd ADM, which I really dig. So if I do etcd ADM reset, what it does is it sees that the etcd service, and this in this case is actually a systemd service as part of etcd ADM's magic is to pull down the etcd binaries, to configure a systemd service and start that service for you and configure it however it needs to be configured. Now this was the this was the uh, the leader in the in the in the previous configuration, but we just removed that leader. And so now if I on on, on one of the other nodes, if I do opt bin etcdctl.sh member list, I can see that there are only two members. And that's because part of the etcd ADM magic that wraps it is removing the member when you do a reset. It does a call to the etcd cluster before doing anything to that etcd node itself. It does a call to etcd and shuts down the, um, and removes that member from the cluster and then shuts down the local stuff and deletes everything, right? And so this member no longer has etcd on it. So if I do systemctl uh, status etcd, I see nothing, right? And if I do it down here, etcd, I can see it's running. And if I do systemctl cat etcd, right, here's the configuration file that is being uh, generated for it. And then the, let's take a look at that. So cat etc etcd etcdmv. <coughs> it's putting all of its data into varlib etcd. And so if I do find varlib etcd, I can see all of the existing data in for this particular member there. But if I were to do that up here, uh, that directory doesn't exist, right? So that's what reset does. And so it actually kind of does this. Yeah, it is kind of a trip, systemd inside of, inside of Docker. Uh, but you know, it's good for lab environments and stuff like this. So let's pause here for just a minute and talk a little bit about etcd and talk about like where you can find more information about etcd. So etcd.io, etcd.io, what is the website for etcd.io, is it etcd.io? Yeah, so if you go to etcd.io, you can find the website for it and their docs are pretty good and they talk about like what etcd is and what it's used for and some of the adopters, you can see, etcd, you can see Kubernetes right at the top. Etcd is a pretty big important part of Kubernetes and it's being used as sort of the backend key value state space. So pretty much everything inside of Kubernetes um, is operates in a way that is stateless. Your controller manager, your scheduler, all of your kubelets, um, <clears throat> the way that they think about, uh, the way that they persist their state is by persisting that state to the API server, either in the form of status updates or in the form of manifests, like things like your, um, your pod manifests and those sorts of things. And all of that state that is persisted by all of these services inside of Kubernetes is persisted into etcd as a key value store. Unless you're running on K3S, in which it could be persisted into SQLite, or if you're in Azure, I think they've got some other backend. But in this, in this conversation, we're gonna be talking about etcd for this. So because etcd holds all of the state for the cluster, obviously that means that it holds a lot of really important information for the, like the ability to manage the lifecycle of your cluster over time. And so, because that's so intrinsically important to the life cycle of your cluster, it's actually probably a really good idea to understand how to manage etcd and understand how etcd is managed for your cluster. And that's the idea of this, of this episode, talk about, talk about how that works in general. Now, typically I talk about etcd, I talk about kubeadm and how kubeadm does this stuff. And so in our example, we're gonna start there and then we're gonna start talking about like, you know, some of the challenges around the kubeadm model and some of the ways to handle etcd uh, in other ways, right? So let's 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 do that next. So here is where we start playing with kind. So let's do uh, let's see, kind kind create cluster config kind. So in this configuration, <coughs> I'm going to bring up just like a stock kubeadm multi-master 
uh, cluster with a sing. I think it's like a single worker node, maybe. But it's really only got the. Uh, but it's got three control plane nodes, so it's an HA configuration of of um, KubeADM. And this is a pretty typical deployment of KubeADM based configuration. And this will take a second to boot up. Let me make this bigger. So <coughs> the way KubeADM handles this stuff, right, is it will actually um, manage what's called a, what we refer to generally as a stacked etcd cluster, in that every control plane node will have a single member of the etcd cluster, and KubeADM will will take care of the um, of the instantiation of that etcd cluster in such a way that as it joins new members to the cluster, it will also join new etcd members to the existing etcd cluster, right? So as a new control plane no node comes up, we actually handle the calls necessary to understand, okay, well, uh, from the API server, let's pull down some of the configuration and maybe the, the shared certs and those sorts of things for these new control plane nodes. And then let's make the call to etcd ADM or to use etcd to join our new control plane node to our existing cluster. And we're gonna look at what that looks like here in a sec inside of kubeadm but but basically as we add more nodes or take uh, um, as we add more control plane nodes kubeadm is handling the manipulation and making sure that uh, these etc that we're forming a an ha compatible um, etcd cluster but there's a cost and we're going to talk about the cost here as well so kubectl get nodes we can see all of our nodes are there. Uh, things are still booting up, but you know, I have two workers and three control plane nodes. And if I docker exec into one of my control plane nodes, kind control plane bash, <coughs> and I do CRI kettle PS, I can see that uh, the way that, that kubeadm handles this is it runs etcd inside of a, um, inside of a uh, pod. And we can find that pod if you're curious about looking into how this works inside of Kubernetes manifests etcd. And this is the entire pod-based configuration for etcd. Right? <coughs> and kubeadm will generate the certs and handle the cert rotation for this stuff. It'll um, it'll handle it'll configure it in such a way that this particular etcd member comes up. It has a health check for it, so if etcd goes wonky, it will actually try to restart etcd. Um, but it starts it up as a static pod manifest. And we can also see host path, right? So we're mounting in the certificates that are going to be used to secure this particular instance of etcd. We're also mounting in the underlying data directory. And so just like we saw on the other, on that uh, other etcd cluster that we created, if we go into varlib etcd, we can see uh, all of the, all of the, the, the data backend for etcd. So here's a recent snapshot of etcd, and here's the write-ahead log for um, for etcd. What just happened? So everybody sees that? But this is Kubernetes the easy way, Chaco. No, I'm kidding. Because I didn't have to like generate certs or do any of that noise. I just did kind create cluster. Anyway. Um, <coughs> now one thing that one. We're gonna get, we're gonna get into like some of the failure scenarios also, but like one thing to know is that when etcd does persist its data to disk, it's gonna generally persist it to varlib etcd. I haven't seen too many exceptions to that rule. Um, and inside of there, you're gonna have a snapshot, and etcd will keep a number of snapshots automatically on, uh, and flush them to disk as part of its just normal operation. And so, if you're in a state where you've lost all uh, access to um, etcd and you want you need to restore etcd from a snapshot. This is a place where you can go look for that snapshot, right? Member snap. And as long as you have a reasonably, uh, a reasonably recent version of a snapshot of etcd, you can get that cluster back. So that is uh, interesting information about how that works. Now I'm, saying, I'm not saying it's easy, but it can be done. And we might explore it in the time that we have today, but we'll see how it goes. It's probably gonna go a little long today. Just so y'all know, it's already two and I'm not even nearly, I'm not even nearly done. Okay. So, our, uh, Etsy, Kubernetes manifest, curl minus LO. Dio, the client diagonal. Let's 
It's no dash. Not bad. So this is a manifest I made to basically kind of troubleshoot etcd. And so let's look at that manifest real quick. This manifest basically um, mounts all the same stuff that kubeadm mounts, and it makes it uh, and, and it makes a bunch of assumptions about how things work. So it's just going to grab a Kate's uh, etcd image. In this case, it's pulling three three ten. I think that the cluster itself is already operating at 343, but close enough. Then we set some environment variables. This is actually a way to configure the etcd client. So etcd ctl is the prefix. And then any of the arguments that you would pass to etcd ctl, you could actually pass um, as environment variables. This is true for etcd server as well, right? And, and we have an example of that over on the other node. And then we mount in the, uh, the CA certificate, and we mount in the health check certificate that we're going to use as a, effectively as a client certificate. And then one of the interesting things is that we're going to use as a SCD, SCD CL, CTL endpoints localhost. And we're doing that because if we look at the way the Cube API server is configured, it's doing the same thing. So according to the Cube API server, the etcd server is uh, available at localhost 2379. I am using the default CNI in kind, yeah. Um, and that's because uh, etcd and the API server are both part of the same network stack, right? They both are part of the host's underlying network stack. And so the API server is able to reference etcd at localhost. But some of the interesting questions are, like what does that mean for connectivity? And that's actually one of the things I want to get into in the lab, is what that means for about, about you know, as it relates to connectivity. Because it means that the API server is going to establish a number of connections, uh, ss minus en, grep 2379. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. I need to make this smaller for just a second. I'll make it bigger in a second. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, So what I'm doing is I'm just basically going to pull all of the connections that are destined for 2379. <coughs> and we're going to count them. So there's about 140 connections destined for port, uh, for localhost on port 2379, right? And so what this means is for, of all of the established connections inside of the current um, connection track, it's all connecting uh, locally to 2379. And that means that even if I have an HA compatible etcd cluster, I'm only ever going to terminate to the local etcd host for, for my connections. So the API server, uh, if configured in this way, will only ever uh, terminate to a local host on 2379. Now this brings up an interesting question. Um, but let me make sure I'm in the right place in the narrative. So at the moment we talked about, we have, uh, yeah, that's what I was gonna do, okay. So, kubectl exec ti dash n kube system etcd client. So now we're inside of our etcd client tool, right? And if I do um, etcd ctl member list, I can see that I have three members. And <coughs> if I do etcd ctl, um, endpoint status, I can see that um, right now uh, the first one that came up, 172.18.09, is, uh, is the leader. Now the way etcd works, uh, only the leader can commit changes, right? And that raises a really interesting question, 
especially in the way that kubeadm configures clusters, right? The really interesting question is, well, since each of the API servers is going to write to whatever that backend SAD member is that we point it to, right? How do we ensure that we're writing to the leader? And the, re and the way that happens is actually in the way that um, it's built into the way that etcd itself works. You can, uh, you, can, you can write or read from any member in the cluster. And what will happen is the etcd server will proxy writes to the leader. So any request that comes in that is a write request will proxy to whatever the current to whoever the current leader is for that write request and then depending on the type of write that you're doing like if you're looking for a guaranteed write inside of etcd that guaranteed write will be um proxied to the leader and then we have to acknowledge that the that the, that the that the data is persisted across all members before returning success um, and in this way we can ensure that all of the members of the etcd cluster have that data before returning success on a guaranteed write. Now there are a couple of different writes that you can achieve. Is it in a kubeadm deployment the kubeadm server only connects to yeah to the to the etcd node on that same node where the control plane is right exactly. And because of the way etcd works right we're persisting that connection we're we're persisting writes back to the leader. We need to make sure that we write to the leader. We can read from anything. And so the other thing that's neat about this is if you think about the way this lays out, uh, if you have multiple etcd nodes, or if you have multiple control plane nodes, those control plane nodes are going to be um, putting all of their read load on that local member. And only the member that is the leader is going to be doing double duty. The member that's going to be doing the leader is going to be handling writes and reads, but, only, but, but from the read perspective, it's actually being pretty well dispersed across the set as far as load. That is the default setup for S for kubeadm, yes. Eh, I agree. And it also adds adds complexity, right? So like one of the things that actually uh, that makes it challenge challenging is like what if I wanted to um, blow away the node and, and bring it back, right? So let's let's do that. Let's do docker exec bi kind control plane bash and then we'll do kubeadm reset dash f. And so now what I've done is I've like wiped out all of the certificates and I've wiped out all of the, um, the, the, the SED data. And to actually get this member back in, I would have to go back over to one of the other members, upload the certificates, get the um, a join token for the control plane, and then come back over here and do kubeadm uh, join control plane like that to actually join this member back in and I would have to go back through that state of managing the um, of managing the etcd relationship so I'd have to reinstantiate etcd um, but you know once we, since I just wiped that node out uh, one of the questions that I'm actually curious about so if we do um, let's see kubernetes manifest curl minus lo git.io etcd client Gosh. nope yaml rm etcd client dot sh and then we can do cri kettle ps cri kettle exec ti that dude and then we can do etcd ETL, ETL member list. And the good news is that um, because we did kubeadm reset, part of the kubeadm reset is actually removing that member from the cluster. And so that actually is a little bit more of the magic of SED does. But what if I actually just lost that node? How would I handle the removal of that, no of the, of that thing? I'd have to go back in here and delete that no manually to be able to do that. OpenShift does, also does, so does kubeadm, and so let's explore that. All right, clear, kind delete cluster. 
but if you think about it, like, you know, we're basically coupling the, the, the fault domain into that control plane node, right? This is, a, this is the reason, this is the way that KubeADM thinks about the problem. Uh, the control plane node, your API server, your controller manager running there, all of those things, they're all um, a part of the same failure domain. So if you lose a node, you're going to lose that entire node, the etcd member and all of the control plane components. And if you wanted to bring up, and if you wanted to um, repair that node, you'd have to bring up that etcd member and all of those uh, components. Yeah, I agree. I've, I mean, it's definitely got some challenges to it for sure. And mostly they relate about state because if you think about it, just like if you remember earlier in the episode, I talked about like uh, state management, right? Um, because etcd is where you're hosting most of your state, you have to think about like, okay, well, now I have to worry a, a little bit about the, 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 the failure domain of that state as I couple things that are stateless like control plane nodes and, and those things into it. So if I wanted to add another set, another API server, I'm coupling that with adding another etcd member. And that may not be the right thing, uh, depending on how you're actually managing the life cycle of your clusters. So, interesting stuff. So let's play with uh, the lab again. Let's go back to our lab. Boop. All right. So uh, I think it's all fixed up again, but let's make sure. Etcd bin ctl.sh member list. Oh. So tar minus xbzf shared. S ca.tgz. What I'm doing here is I'm pre-populating the CA cert and key because etcd ADM is going to use that CA cert and key to mint uh, peer and client certificates for etcd. Yeah, join. etcd lv0 and then where was the command? Ah, you know what? I have actually scripted this. Ha ha! Cat shared scripts join.sh. Right? So I basically made a, a little script that I'll tar my CA file, my, my untar my um, C file, and then it'll just use this command to rejoin a member to the cluster. So let's just go ahead and paste that in. And now if we go back down to here, we jump back into our node. We do opt bin etcdctl.sh member list. We're back to three members. Now, so we got our etcd cluster here. We're going to play with actually like using etcd as an external etcd cluster. We're going to talk about how to configure that and all that stuff as well. But first, let's show that it's empty. Um, and so we're going to use that same command, the etcdctl command. This is a, a trick to interact with etcd. Now remember there, um, we'll do get quote quote from key and then just to limit the output we're going to do keys only so only show me the keys and you can see there's nothing in there it's empty as all the as all get out at the moment which is good right because we're going to about to bring up a cluster that will use this etcd cluster um, for our, for our configuration move into our kind directory and then we're going to look at the two different options the two different configurations that i've got here right so Let's look at the kind each member first. Now this is probably the more um, common way to manage this. In which you configure your API server to point to each member of your SED cluster. And there are some challenges with this too, right? Like, I mean, we're definitely making the assumption that uh, all of these members are reachable and that you can resolve them using the host name that you've given them. And if you have to replace one, you're going to have to restart or reconfigure or at least make sure that you're using the same host name and that the etcd client certificate is going to work. We're making a bunch of assumptions in the way around this, this configuration. And that it's, it's somewhat brittle. Um, and so we got to get all three host names right and we got to get all that stuff all wired up. But let's make the assumption that we did that and let's uh, bring that kind cluster up. So let's do kind create cluster config find each member and I'm just going to bring up like the the, the control I believe this is a, I can't remember how many control plane nodes I've got going on here but let's let's play with it and see
the neat thing about these labs is that we can like break stuff and play with things and like show how they work and all that good stuff and kind of some interesting ways. While that's happening, I'm gonna bring up another set of terminals. Because what I wanna show is I think I did this before with ah. Let's do the CD lab. And we'll do footloose status. Do cube kettle get node. Why? Oh, we don't have the footloose. Show. Dash o JSON. Aha. Gotta remember to record that this time. Okay. JQ. zero there but I want all of these Now we have our IP addresses, so now we can do CSSH minus L or yeah root and then 172.17.18.0.2.4. Sweet. Alright. I know that seems like a lot of magic. I'm using CSSH to kind of like, you know, handle the connection to a bunch of hosts. Because I'm old school like that. Bring that down a little bit. This is probably too small to see anyway, isn't it? Yeah, this isn't going to work. Okay. But at least we can derive from that. So we'll do split. Split vertical. Vertical. Resize that a little bit. Root at one seventy two eighteen zero two.
And then I'm actually using Terminator. So I'm going to make these a part of a group. New group. CD. Grouping. Apparently have a bug or something. New group. Yes. Ah, there we go. Grouping Zeta. Grouping Zeta. So then we can also do things like broadcast group. And then this allows us to do some cool magic like that. And then we can do, um, let's make this a little bigger. This one. All right, so that's all good. And then we can do SS minus EN, grep 2379, grep minus C 2379, watch. All part of the lab experience here. So we're gonna basically monitor the number of connections to uh, 2379. Uh, of which there are very few, which is interesting because I thought I'd brought up a cluster. What happened? Woo, somebody's not happy. Yowza. Oh, did I mess up something? Let's see. Cat kind each member. What was I connected to before? Got to retry after one second for kind load balancer 6443. What is that? Something is not right. Try it again. Kind delete cluster. Kind create cluster. Config. Let's see where we failed. It looks like something broke. What do we got doing with the chat? How's everybody doing? Mr. Josh Ross is saying hello. We got Tmux. Uh oh, yeah. Nice to manage lifecycle independently. I agree. Terminator versus Alacrity. I haven't played with Alacrity. I'm on a Linux box though, but might be worth checking out. Um, yeah, exactly. Scaling it independently from the control plane. So let's see what happens here. Should be working. So Salaf says, we have vSAN, but I try I tried on shared vSAN, which was very slow. TNK, yeah, you would not want to back SED on something that wasn't a disk. <laughs> no, I don't think so. No, it's already fixed. And I had this working earlier in the week, so I'm curious myself. So let's see what happens. Docker exec kind control plane bash sphere I kettle yes oh interesting so this is a debugging QADM I've got a control plane and I've got but I don't have an API server so if I do ps minus a I can see that the API server has exited and if we do uh, CRI kettle logs 
We are probably going to find our smoking gun. No such file or directory. Epi API server SED client search. So I haven't given it a search. Somehow I screwed that up. <laughs> Etsy, uh, Etsy, Kubernetes. Guy. CD. Uh, hold on. Oh, I think I know what happened. Okay, so this makes sense now. Kind, delete cluster. So inside of my configuration, let's look at it quickly and then we can fix it ourselves, right? So kind, uh, each member. So there's this mount here where I'm mounting in uh, a, a, a relative directory. I'm mounting in the shared relative directory. But the problem is that I'm doing it from the kind directory because my shared directory is actually in from the, in this path. The beauty of relative directories, my friends, that is the challenge. So now if I do kind create cluster config uh, kind kind each member, this time it'll work. How about that? No, I think it actually worked out. I've got that part wired up. I think I have that right. So let's jump in here and we'll do docker exec ti kind control plane bash ls etsy kubernetes ki cd. Haha! -ha. Hey, it worked. All right. Relative directories. It's always, it's like, you know, if it isn't DNS, it's relative directories. Anyway, you get the problem. That was the problem. All fixed up. Now we have our control plane nodes joining. Let's flip over to this and we can see actually when that first member, when that first host joined, we had 70 connections and now we have 140 connections when the second host joins. And then here in a second, we should see the third host join. Hey, we're basically increasing by 70. So, in this model, each of my SED members has 208 connections, and this is spread from each of the, uh, and, and this, this is uh, the number of connections spread across each of my control plane nodes. And if I docker exec in here to one of my members, 32, Bash. No, oh, I'm sorry. That'd be cool. What do you think about naming it by host? And I do op bin etcd ctl dot sh. Um, sorry, that's not what I wanted. I was jumping in here to show something else. Ah, okay. So we have all of these connections, each one of them going, each one of the, each one of our hosts is connecting to all three etcd nodes. In fact, so if we dock, if we jump into one of our control planes, kind control plane, docker exec ti kind control plane bash, and we do ss minus en grep minus 32, oops, 72, 18, 0, 2379, Oc, print dollar sign 6, WC minus L, see, how you do that? Grab minus C. Unique minus, uh, sort, unique minus C. Old school tools, all right. 
So we have on this particular node, right, we have um, 68 connections to each of the etcd members. Now, this actually uh, means, uh, and again, there were some challenge. There are definitely some challenges in the way this works. But some of the challenges are that, like, um, the API server configuration is static. I can't, um, I can't update the, um, the the members dynamically. I'd have to actually go to each API server and change the member list if I had to remove an uh, remove an etcd member and bring up a new etcd member. Okay. Um, but let's go ahead and play with the idea of what happens if I remove if I turn down one of my members. So again, kind of in this etcd member, like we're coming up with different ideas and things to break, and so let's do that. Docker exec ti etcd member zero bash, and then shared etcd adm reset. And now I only have two members, but I still have quorum. I can see that member zero sees no connections, which makes sense. And I can see that the number of connections hasn't changed. Each of the etcd member, each of the API servers is still only connecting to that, to the, to the remaining two members, right? So if I go back in here, I can see that on my control plane node, I'm still only, con I'm still only connecting to the two members that are left. I have no connections going out to the other one, no established connections anyway. But I haven't increased the number of connections to the remaining members. Isn't that interesting? But if I were to kill one more member, shared etcd adm reset. Now I only have one member left. It's etcd uh, member two. Two, yeah, it's only NCD member two left. And if we flip back over there, we can see we still don't have an increase in the number of connections. Um, and now we only have connections to one of the SCD members. Um, and the other interesting thing is, despite all of these crazy hijinks we're playing with, we still have a cluster. kubectl get pods dash a. Right, and we can still do kubectl create deployment test image equals test uh, ba um, bash nginx. Right, and then we see we should see this join. Oh, you know what? We don't have any control plane nodes. Ha. <laughs> anyway. Um, kubectl describe pod dash n kubectl get nodes yeah I only have masters I didn't but kubectl get node dash o I'd have to remove the taint if I want this to work There we go. How about that craziness? That's something, he says. But what if the state split? Like, what if you had a split brain scenario? Like, we had two working, but like the other pieces aren't? All right, so we got our cluster up. So everything's continuing to work and everything's fine. Uh, we didn't lose quorum because as we reduced the size of the cluster, we also removed the members, right? If we had if we had just shut that, if we had, instead of using etcd ADM reset, if we had just shut down etcd, in fact, that's another thing to play with. Let's play with that idea. This is, a, this is actually one of the failure modes of etcd. So, scripts join.sh. Opt in CTL.sh member 
list. So we're back to a three member cluster. We're back to endpoint health. All three are in good shape. Status. And obviously the one. Ah. Okay. And um, the, the, mem the, the leader is going to be member two. He's the only one that's left that, that could be the leader. So. Let's play with a failure node real quick, or a failure mode real quick, and then we'll also play with like an upgrade case, which I think will also be kind of interesting, talking about etcd. So in our case, like we said, um, uh, the neat thing about this is that because there's no etcd running on the control plane node, I can wipe that control plane node, I can reboot it, I can do all that stuff, and I don't have to worry about managing the state, right? Um, I, can just, I can just worry about the stateless applications, which makes it a lot simpler to think about, because etcd is not running on the control plane node at the Kubernetes manifest, we can see that etcd is not in the list, right? So that's a good thing. So, and actually we're starting to see connections come back, right? So same thing we saw before. Um, some of these connections are now being able to, are able to reestablish to the other members. And we should see it level off at about 208 as time goes by and, and connections are reestablished. So basically the API servers and the cube, the API servers are, are starting to kind of work back in and, and bring and rehydrate those connections that had been terminated and reconnect. But, but the pattern for connection on the API server is that we'll establish so many connections to each of the etcd members. Okay, so that's kind of a neat thing. So let's do a failure. Let's, let's like bring the etcd cluster down, but we'll do it in a different way than we did before. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead. We'll do a uh, we'll do a reset on etcd member zero. Shared etcd adm reset, and now we only have two members. But this time, for a member one, instead of doing a reset, which will actually take the action of effectively remove of changing quorum back down to a single member, I'm not, I'm going to just turn it off. Let's see what happens. Right. So if I do system ctl stop etcd and we flip back over and i do cube kettle get pods dash a oh not good so at the no i have quorum three um I, actually what i'm doing is i'm, I'm using I'm, I'm allowing etcd to define quorum by manipulating the number of members known about Right, and so in this particular case, even though I still have connections to etcd, I have lost quorum. I no longer have quorum because I've actually just removed the, the second member. Even though it's uh, it was quorum three because I had brought up to three members and then I got back down to one without actually removing the member. So in this case, I'm, a, I'm in a failure mode in that I have only a single member remaining and I have lost quorum. And when that and when you're in that state, that means the uh, the Kubernetes cluster is not usable. Even though I still have connections to that the the remaining member, I'm not able to use it. So how do you think I could fix this? I could restart etcd. And as soon as I do, I get my quorum back. And as soon as I get my quorum back, I'm back in play. Oh, weird. Are you all still there? Hello? like I've just lost my chat. Okay, good. You can still see me. Okay, what's weird is like my, my chat window went away and I was trying to figure out why, but that doesn't really matter. As long as you can all still see me, we're going to keep going. So let's talk about Quorum real quick and we'll explain what's happening here. Okay, so um, <clears throat> probably a really good doc on this on the actual website. Let's just click back over there and do that.
I remember there being a dock. All right, so this is actually the dock I was looking for. It's in, it's in the administration side for V2, and I imagine that there's probably also some of this content for V3 as well. But I mean, this part of it, it still kind of applies to both, to be honest, because it's really about um, the quorum piece. So optimal cluster size, uh, they, the recommended SCD cluster size is three members, five members, or seven, and it describes like the fault tolerance, right? And also um, uh, kind of what the majority part means, right? So if you have a single member, the majority is one, and uh, you have a failure tolerance of zero. Obviously, because if that member goes away, you're done. There's no more data. Um, if you have two members, the majority is two, uh, because it's moving toward a quorum of three, which is interesting, and you have a failure tolerance of a single member. So when I added that second member, when, the, when I told both of the members in the cluster that there was another member out there, I went to a majority of two. And that means that um, I now have a quorum of two, and if I were and if I were to turn one of those members off, the cluster itself will determine itself. It will determine itself in a, an unhealthy state, and it will not proceed. Um, in some cases, you can still read, but you won't be able to write uh, because quorum has been lost. So when I did my recovery, I basically turned that member back on, and that brought me back to majority, and that means that I could continue to interact with the SED cluster the way I had been before. Um, but <clears throat> you can see how this maps uh, uh, going further, right? So if I jumped into three members, I, would ha I could actually lose one member without adversely affecting my cluster. If I popped up to four members, I could lose two without, adver I, could lo I could lose one without, uh, without, losing, without losing quorum in my cluster. Um, and that's, and these, this cluster size assumes, this number is assuming voting members. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, but once you get up into five members, then you can actually lose two members without losing the without losing access to the cluster, and then it kind of starts to grow from there, right? Um, assuming that all members of your etcd cluster are voting members, um, and then changing the etcd cluster and the member migration. These docs are really good; definitely worth checking them out. Like a lot of this was written when we were core OS, and have been uh, updated since. So our failure mode right here, when we just killed this. When I, when I turn that member off, uh, when I turn this off, I'm basically losing quorum. And when I do that, I can no longer access the cluster because I've lost majority. Like uh, it's a total majority loss. And for me to actually recover this, uh, I'll say what? Okay, uh, I scrolled. And so um, <clears throat> for me to recover this, I would actually have to reinstantiate this member as a, as a, as a quorum of one. So I could take a snapshot, or I could restart this, or or I could uh, restart this cluster from a single snapshot, bringing back a majority of one, and then the cluster would come back up and work. Or, alternatively, I could just come back into that state and um, continue to work there. So let's do that. Um, I put it to you. Do you want do you want to see me lose quorum and then fix it like in such a way that we like leverage um, SED ADM to restore from a snapshot? Y'all want to see that? I'm watching vlogs in you know, the chat. See if that's something that might be interesting to you. Uh, if so, I could probably do like you know another episode on SED or something. But if it's interesting, I can. The remaining SED logs. Yeah, sure. Let's do that. Uh, Docker. Number two, bash. 
Experimental kettle, minus up all you, STD. So basically it's complaining that um, registry health isn't so great. Um, and yeah, the logs are freaking out. Health for peer is not good. There's only one other peer known about right now, and that guy is not good. And so it's 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 struggling to actually reach quorum, and it can't, right? So eventually it'll freak out completely, and um, but let's go ahead and we'll keep this tail going. We'll make this bigger. We'll put it down there. We'll do a little resizing. So we can't even do read re re request because it's totally done. But let's go ahead and do docker exec ti um, etcd member zero, uh, one system ctl start etcd. And then as soon as that becomes healthy again, we can see the connection happening, right? And then boom, we've just unblocked the world and now we're like getting stampeding herd, right? The API servers, all those controller managers uh, and everything else trying to actually do reads against etcd are now able to hit and now suddenly we're unblocked. And so like all of the reads are happening again and we're back in play. It, yeah, it's trying to elect itself, but in a quorum of two. And since it's a quorum of two, it can't, right? It can't, it can't re-elect itself. And so, yeah, good stuff. I'm gonna do a refresh of this page. For some reason, I'm not getting the, the chat. One second here. There we go. Pop out chat. Now I can actually see the chat again. Eventually. Ah, all right. I'm back now. Yeah. So it's back now. And if I do, um, you know kubekit i'll get pods dash a everything is interacting again you can see some stuff has rebooted has rebooted in the time in between um because we lost etcd and you know uh because we lost etcd for a while it like freaked out so it is now working and we're still seeing like um yeah we're seeing these work it's saying took took too long probably because we're still sharing the same io for everything and so the that is one of the big, other big challenges of etcd and one of the things to really keep in mind i want to make sure we cover that is um the other big challenge of um of, or one of the other big benefits of moving etcd off of control plane nodes is that you can be really careful about um the uh io requirement because etcd needs to flush to disk for for writes um it's pretty io intensive and that means that if you had something like a log forwarder or um, something else that was actually consuming a lot of I.O. from a shared disk, then um, you, you can be constrained by that, right? Um, and, and, and in a way, that's actually what's happening here, right? Uh, my entire system is uh, um, on a single disk right now, including these etcd members. And that means that as I increase the amount of I.O. that I need in other things, I'm going to lose uh, margin to etcd. And that, and that can actually cause things to be bad. Yeah, Quorum 2 is worse than Quorum 1. I agree. But, yeah. Okay, so cool. So that's... Any other questions before we move on? Can you do a sna Can you do the snapshot with etcd instead of ADM to be generic? Uh, what? I didn't take a snapshot. The only snapshots I have of this system are the ones that are persisted to disk. Quorum 2...
Oh, that is cool. Yeah, docs.gocorum. That's a great point. I forgot about that doc. That is a really good one. Docs.gocorum.com and latest cons consensus. Great call out. I had forgotten this talk existed and it really def it definitely um, describes like the different models, right? So we have leader, verifier, learner. Um, really talking about how Quorum and Raft works. And I thought that there was actually a talk specifically about SED. I know that there have been a few different um, uh, Raft um, uh, descriptions of how it works in SED and especially because SED now has different modes, which is actually really cool. Um, so etcd now has a uh, member. You have different types. So you can have a voting member and you can have a learning member. And you can basically configure like what mode that member will be in. I'm trying to find where that documentation is, but now you have. All right, but we need to keep moving forward. So let's keep going. Um, next thing I wanted to talk about was monitoring because one of the questions that somebody asked was um was in understanding like how to how to monitor etcd and how to debug it and that sort of stuff now what's neat is etcd is a go program so it does have a debug pprof if you enable it uh you can actually really get, dig into like the crazy details of of where etcd the binary is spending its time um so if you're if you have a scenario where you're where things are just not working the way you expect you can really kind of dig into like what's happening there uh I don't really see that happening super often, but there's also a debug requests endpoint, which gives you the um, the ability to kind of debug what's happening in the requests, and right, and so you can see like what the keys and the values are. This was a question that Mr. Michael Gauch uh, asked. It was basically like digging into like how you can actually see um, what some of the requests are coming into SED. Now, obviously, turning on debug incurs a um, uh, a performance penalty as well, so. You're going to want to be careful about how you do it, right? Make sure that you're doing that sort of stuff inside of um, inside of uh, inside of a place where you're not where that performance penalty isn't going to bring your configuration down to its knees. Uh, Etcd is instrumented with Prometheus, and there are some dashboards um, <coughs> that. It can be used. Uh, there's a there's a oh wow that's broken, um, but there is actually an etcd um, dashboard in the Prome in the Grafana marketplace where you can actually uh, instrument this stuff, and so it has an example of what that um, dashboard is. When configuring etcd, typically you're going to need a client certificate to authenticate to etcd, even for metrics. And so it's important to keep that in mind, right? If you're going to because you're going to have to authenticate to Etcd even for metrics. Um, and to, let's just kind of show that off a little bit here. So if I if I jump in here, uh, Docker exec uh, member zero uh, Etcd member one bash. So we can see etcd is listing on port 2379 and port 2380. And if we do a curl for um, 132, 1803, 2379 slash metrics, it is uh, TLS secured. I'm going to turn off the uh, CA check. 
and then we can see uh, this result, which is a little confusing at first, maybe if you don't understand what's happening. But what it's telling you is that um, this is not enough information for me to allow this connection. I need a client cert also. So here's one way to get that, right? So um, cert equals Etsy, etcd, uh, and then we'll use the API server etcd client cert, and key, etsy, etcd, pki, api server, key, we'll turn off uh, the CA certificate validation, and then we'll try our same command before, right? So again, pointing at this local member, and now we see uh, metrics come back. What's going on with the chat? How are y'all doing? Is the webcast still frozen? Or are we good? Hopefully the webcast is still good. Okay, good. Um, you can scrape, that's true actually. If you, 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 you can configure etcd such that the um, metrics endpoint is hanging off, a, off, off of an insecure port. Uh, in my in the in most cases though, and I think even in QBDM's case, etcd is configured to um, is still serve on that on that member. Now, what's neat about this uh, <coughs> is that you can actually, I mean, if, when you're trying to actually understand like what metrics are important to monitor, it's uh, it's really useful to be able to see like what the actual metrics are that are exposed, right? And so this is a way of kind of pulling back uh, what they what they are and see and and see kind of like. Um, uh, what the result, what the resultant metrics would be, right? So we have, I'm going to go ahead and pull a grep for help, which pulls, which kind of describes like the, the, um, the helpline for each of the metrics that is exposed. <coughs> and so we have things like making sure, like how, how many milliseconds uh, DB camp action took how many milliseconds particular deletes took or events. Um, and this is just looking at SED as kind of a general tool, right? It's like for this particular member, here are the, the metrics related to things that we think are important to, to monitor for SED, right? So how long it took to actually commit the backend uh, for SED disk, what the F-sync duration period is. These are really pretty important metrics to understand kind of the overall health of SED in general, right? Like how long uh, it takes for us to persist a disk can be an indicator in, in whether there's I.O. starvation happening on the node. And if there is I.O. starvation, you're going to see things taking longer to, um, to coalesce. You're going to see things failing in kind of interesting ways. And that's why it's actually pretty cool that these metrics are exposed by every member. Um, we also have a metric for whether this particular member is uh, etcd or is the leader or not. We have um, metrics coming back to go mem stats, right? Uh, exposing how much uh, how much memory is being used and kind of the GC mechanisms and all of that sort of stuff for those things. Uh, how many CPU seconds are in use? Open file handles, uh, resident memory. That's a, it's a pretty complete metric set um, that describes the health of this etcd cluster. But one of the things I wanted to point out um, is that we also, because we're actually uh, vendoring in etcd as part of the API server, we also expose some really interesting information from the API server. And I think I've talked about this in a previous episode, but if not, uh, let's go ahead and look at that real quick. So if we do get raw, metrics. Now what this is going to do is it's actually going to redirect me to any to one of my API servers, <coughs> and it's going to expose the metrics that are exposed by by that etcd uh, by that API server. So each of the API servers are also um, exposing a metrics endpoint, and we can grep for etcd inside of there, and we can see um, basically how uh, what we expose at the etcd layer. Uh, from the client side. Now, because we're doing this at the client side, we can actually see some other really interesting information, especially if you're trying to troubleshoot a failed etcd cluster. There's a lot of really good information that is exposed at the client side. 
like how many connections or um, the different types, uh, you know, how long it takes to actually uh, make a request for particular information. Um, one of the other things I really like is this particular request. This is actually um, dash i items. No. Count. Here we go. Object count. That's what I'm looking for. So if we do grep etcd object count, we can see um, how many objects of, of which type are being stored in etcd. And so if you're looking for uh, challenges, um, if, you're, if you're seeing etcd kind of slow down and you think perhaps what's happening is you're overloading it, or you think that uh, something has been generated that like uh, is overloading etcd of a particular type, this is actually a pretty interesting troubleshooting step to understand what you're storing by type in etcd. So you can see we're storing 60 cluster roles, we're storing 45 cluster role bindings. Um, Events-wise, we're storing 156 events, and those will age out over time, but it is pretty interesting. And so, um, yeah, I think that is that. So one more example I want to dig into before I call it a day. Uh, but one more thing, one other thing I want to actually mention is uh, when you're looking at these events, when you're looking at the uh, object counts, one of the things that is highlighted here is that the biggest object count that we have inside the cluster right now is events. And it's also the highest churn. It represents the biggest amount of churn inside of an etcd cluster. And so one of the patterns for etcd, especially in big stable environments, is to move the events off onto a different etcd cluster. I'm not going to explore that here in this episode. But it is a configuration of the API server in which you can specify a particular path, in this case, registry events, and push that to a different etcd cluster rather than having that sit against your main etcd cluster. And this is one of the mechanisms by which you can actually handle the scaling of etcd, especially in large clusters, differently. Um, so I just wanted to call that out. So back to this example in our lab, which I think is still interesting, right? So um, I'm gonna go ahead and join the member zero member back in and I'm gonna play with putting a load balancer of etcd in front of our cluster so we'll do kind delete cluster blow away our cluster here real quick and we'll do kind create cluster config and before before we do that, vim kind, kind lb0, you can see I'm actually pointing at a load balancer. And this load balancer uh, is that HA proxy configuration. We do docker exec ti uh, lb0 bash. Uh, and then we do cat etsy ha proxy ha proxy config. I remember I'm actually pointing back to all three members of the SED cluster and I'm not terminating TLS here. I'm basically just using it as a, a layer four load balancer back to my backend nodes, right? And so connection comes in here and I establish a new connection back to the backend node, but I don't turn ter terminate TLS and I'm trying to balance based on the least number of connections. So the goal would be to make it so that I have an even number of connections to each of the members. So let's play with this connectivity pattern. Um, real quick before we before we move on to the next piece here. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring up that cluster. Try and create cluster config kind kind LB0. And then we'll do Docker. Actually we'll do split this one. Docker exec ti kind etcd lb0 journal kettle lu ha proxy. So now we're starting to see connections, or we're starting to see connections try to make it. If 
but we'll see a really interesting failure here um, here in a second and we'll talk about why that why that failed the way it did it's gonna be kind of interesting so docker exec ti number of zero haha -ha. so this is actually kind of neat um, at least I like it <coughs> so what's happening here um, is that the when we try to join beyond the first member, there's already a um, a member named Kind Control Plane Two, and it's already in uh, status ready. Because when we deleted the members, when we deleted the old cluster, we just left the state in etcd behind. And so what that what that meant was that um, there's already an existing definition for certain things inside the cluster. So here's an interesting, an, inter an interesting thing inside the lab that we can do is that we can go ahead and um, we can kind of uh, configure that in such a way that it'll work. So let's, let's play with that real quick. Scripts join.sh. So now we got our listing, we got our listing ports here. So then we're going to do um, member zero bash opt bin etcdctl sh get see I'm going to make this another tab because I think it'll be easier to read number zero bash opt bin tl.sh member list. So we can see all of our members are up, and if we do our get, just like we did before, right? From keys, keys only. We can see all of these uh, <coughs> uh, paths are still defined, right? Um, and we can see Specifically in the, let's see, where is it? Lay, where's the leases? The leases are We can see these control. The nodes are still defined within uh, kind control plane, kind control plane two, kind control plane three. We still have a bunch of events, which is pretty typical. We still have minions, kind control plane, control plane two, control plane three. This is an interesting artifact of like the history of Kubernetes. Originally, these were called uh, these weren't called nodes. They were called minions. And then we also have these lease objects, right? The lease control plane two, control plane three, control plane four. Let's take a look at the health of the minion real quick. <coughs> so in this configuration, we can actually, let's just do table dash O JSON. Dash W. Table. Fields. better there so what we're seeing here is kind of the artifact of it being like uh, put a rough driven um, so this is the key and then the value is encoded in right 
And so it's a little hard to read, especially with all these fields, but you can see basically um, what's happening here. I think there's a way. So JSON. Let's just play with this for a second. I think. Do I have JQ here? App update. Actually, install JQ. I want to pull out the value. KVS dot value. Base sixty four minus D. Do a like no color thing or something minus no color So there's a couple different fields here, and really what I want to do is I want to just echo the one field. Which is not helpful. Sure, it's pretty though, right? Can you see the Can you see the node? Kind of fun. All right, let's go back and do this again because I think the simple output was probably the simplest. Because at least we get some readable fields, and uh, what I wanted to show was the. Status object. The control plane is there. Here's the pod cider. There's all those new field thingies. This is a V1 node. What we can see is that the we have a type ready. And then basically it is in an in a ready state, but it's hard to read that. Well that's fields v1. But yeah, so it's still in a in a ready state. So my point is, we could actually um, manipulate the data though, right? So we could do, let's do this. Let's do delete, del, from key. And we just deleted 140 lines worth of data, uh, starting at path registry minions. And we could also, and so now if we do get
from key keys only. We don't see the we don't see the the minions anymore. But let's also nuke leases real quick, right? Because we don't want we don't want that we don't want it to assume anything about leases. So let's get rid of that leases from key. Got rid of that. And now we should be able to, uh, effectively we just modified the content of etcd and now we should be able to bring our cluster back up because there's no conflicting records. It would be neat if it was JSON path, but it's not JSON path because I was interacting with etcd directly. If I'd actually done this with, uh, if I'd start up like a little temporary SD control plane, then it would have worked that way. Kind of getting off the reservation here a little bit, but bear with me. It'll be, it'll still be fun. So I just deleted the nodes and deleted the leases from the uh, stored data in etcd. Um, kind of willy. Kind of crazy, but. So now we're seeing the increase in the number of connections as we bring up new control plane nodes, just like we saw before. Remember our steady state when we were doing per node etcd was 208 connections per node. Um, but our steady state right now is 72 connections because, and this is interesting. Yeah, I can talk about leases a little bit more but here in a moment. <clears throat> so you remember before when we actually brought up each member of our cluster of our three node node of our three node cluster, right? We got our three nodes. Um, <clears throat> each member was actually connecting to uh, each member of our etcd node, right? So in our old configuration, cat kind, kind each member, we had we were telling each API server about each uh, etcd member. But in our new configuration, we're only telling it about the load balancer. And that reduces the number of connections that the API server is going to make because it only has one endpoint. It has the endpoint that is the load balancer. And so it's actually going to terminate all of the connection pool that the etcd client inside, embedded inside of etcd is going to use toward that load balancer. And so for each member, uh, for each API server, we're going to establish that same number of connections. I think, believe it's uh, 30 or, you know, probably could be like a little bit less, 24 connections per, per uh, right around 20, 20 connections, 20 connections per control plane node, right? And we can see what it is, right? We don't have to guess. Let's go ahead and go over to four. Docker exec ti kind control plane bash. And we'll do ss minus establish connections, grep 2379, wc minus l. And this is both directions. So we would uh, uh, actually, let's do our awk print dollar sign six. And then wc minus l. So we have 70 connections from this. So we have 68 connections from this host, and we'll have 68 connections from each of the two, uh, each of the three hosts. Um, but in our case, that's spread across three hosts. So we see those 68 connections kind of uh, dispersed across each host. But what about the different failure scenarios, right? So like right, right now, we're seeing the the termination. Uh, right now, we're looking at HA proxy. We're seeing those connections balanced across each etcd member. Um, that's what we're looking at here. But let's play with the different failure scenarios that we played with before, right? So let's go ahead and terminate, or let's go ahead and remove this member. And what do you think is going to happen? Any theories about what's going to happen? Uh, if I remove a member from behind HA proxy, what is going to happen to the connection path? Remember, we're using a load balancer now. So what's going to happen? What do you think? Anybody have an idea? I 
Actually, with a system CTL, shut it down. It'll switch over to an up node. Exactly! Boom! So unlike the previous connection pattern, right? Where we saw the uh, where we saw the um, the uh, the connections the connection count remain the same. Instead, we're seeing more connections on the remaining members, right? Because uh, the API server is still trying to connect to the only thing it knows about, which is the load balancer. And what it just got was a whole bunch of resets back from um, or a whole bunch of connection closes co co closed on a whole bunch of the existing connections that it had. And so then it was like, well, let's try that again. I, I need to have a minimum of those 68 connections in my connection pool from the API server to that backend etcd instance. And so uh, as soon as those new connections come in, the HA proxy starts balancing them over the up nodes. So let's play with this a little bit more. Let's kill a new member. First, let's bring this back up. So system CTL start etcd. And what do you think will happen? So there's our four listening ports. And now as we wait for a second, we're going to start seeing connections get shifted over. As they come and go, as connections die, we're going to start seeing that balance get, uh, get brought back up. As the API server terminates its connections and starts reestablishing new connections, we're going to see that um, balance start getting turned up. In our log here, where we see etcd member zero become, become healthy again. And then as connections rotate over here, we're going to send it to the least connected node, which is right now this one. So all new connections should be terminating on member zero. So that was pretty cool. So one kind of interesting way to, to, to hack this is what if we actually nuke our uh, system CTL restart HA proxy. Wow, immediate balance, right? And again, because HA proxy comes up and it starts to disperse connections, we were actually down for just a brief moment there. Well, and actually, because of HA proxy, because of the restart command, it probably didn't actually lose any connectivity. But we can still do get get pods dash a. Let's do a watch kubectl get pods dash a. So now every two seconds, right? If I do that, com that command, that restart again, I didn't actually see the hit uh, in etcd. So. In this case, because I'm using HA proxy and because HA proxy has effectively live reloading, I didn't see a drop in connectivity from the API servers. I was still able to connect to it. Let's get a little more crazy. Let's turn some stuff off. We'll do shared etcd ADM reset. Let's do that to member one. We're seeing etcd member zero just got turned down. We're seeing etcd member one about to get turned down. Now we see all of our connections going to member two. That looks that number looks familiar, right? 208 connections. I know it is kind of pleasing in some weird way. So now we got our, uh, our got our members back up. Um, our etcd server is still responding. It's been responding the whole time. And new connections are going to start balancing. And you know, if we just let this run, it, they will balance over time. Right? We're going to see those connections balance across the the remaining set. Um, it's not going to be super aggressive because remember that. Um, uh, 
Kubernetes uses a connection pool back to the etcd cluster, right? And so it's going to just maintain that connection pool. And as it uh, iterates over those connections and uh, they terminate or they cl get closed, we're going to establish new connections to, uh, via the HA proxy to existing nodes, right? So let's try and actually force some of that uh, churn a little bit, right? So let's do kubectl. Actually, first we need to do control R. Go to kubectl. Go. Shell expansion. And it really didn't do much for our, our model. What if we go to the kind control planes? We do Sierra kettle PS uh, RM minus F Sierra kettle. Yes, minus Q. What this is doing is basically going to force restart the control plane nodes and all of the other pods on that on that on that particular um, host. So it's kind of like restarting that host. Now we're starting to see some churn. Yeah. So. I mean, so let's talk about like resilience real quick. And then this is actually kind of the last topic I want to talk about before we move on, right? So what we talked about here is a couple of different patterns for um, hosting etcd. We've talked about why stacked etcd and external etcd have different trade-offs. With stacked etcd, you can kind of couple it into tooling like kubeadm. With external etcd, you can decouple state from the control plane and you can like easier manage like, you know, scaling up or scaling down your control plane nodes without having to also scale up and down etcd so scaling these things differently it's sort of the same argument about like whether you would want to put a stateful thing and your application in the same pod or not right separating these things out into different pods give you better control over the different aspects of it we've talked about uh different deployment patterns uh if we deploy um a con a, a configuration in which we tell the api server about each of the etcd members then we get more, we get a bigger connection pool uh, and a more resilient connection pool back to all of the etcd members. But at the same time, we have a static configuration in API server. We can't really modify that list without restarting the API server. Now restarting the API server doesn't come at a huge cost because generally speaking, you're gonna have multiple of them, but it's one of those things where we have to think about when we think about the configuration of these things. Um, we've talked about in putting a load balancer in between etcd and the cluster uh, between between etcd and uh, your kubernetes cluster um, and the benefit of that putting a load balancer is that you get a little bit more resilience in in the way that you determine the back-end connections right but at the same time you end up with a smaller connection pool for the api server the api server is only going to establish those 64 connections to that single etcd member 
Um, so that's kind of interesting also. And that means that the resilience wise, you're gonna have to kind of deal with that behavior. So these are all different things that you can kind of model and play with and, and explore in the way that you think about the way etcd interacts with your etcd with your kubernetes cluster and 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 what i'm going to commit here is basically a lab that would allow you to kind of explore those things um independently of manipulating an existing cluster right and so it's just kind of a an interesting way of basically you know exploring the different tools and and the different tooling that you have at your disposal so one of the other things i i really love about this lab is that you can also um break things and fix things and, and explore different models for how to fix things. Like if you wanted to actually explore uh, getting, you know, breaking quorum down to a level one and then figuring out how to uh, reestablish quorum, um, that is a thing that you could explore in this lab without having to actually break the world. Now I might come back and do another etcd member, uh, another etcd um, session on just breaking quorum and fixing it and those sorts of things, like problems I've seen in the wild and those sorts of things. but. But yeah, it's like, um, it's definitely failure scenario management. It's like, you know, in like in security, we have this idea of, or in uh, application and infrastructure security, we have this idea of a threat model, right? In which you describe the, um, I should be talking about this stuff in my control shift two. In which we describe the, the, the threats that we perceive and how we want to, th and, and those threats that we're trying to actually um, uh, protect against, right? And so this is, in a way, this is kind of a threat model for infrastructure. And this is the way that we think about resiliency and the way that we think about um, the different failure scenarios. Instead of a threat model as it relates to security, we might think of that threat model as it relates to infrastructure, right? Um, and so stuff like this is actually, uh, tooling like this is just incredible for improving the way that we can both assess and evaluate the different um, failure modes uh, for systems like etcd and kubernetes. And, and I really hope that as you're exploring some of the more complex distributed systems that you might deploy on top of kubernetes that you keep models like this in mind, right? Like being able to uh, model these things in a way that is in production or model these things in different environments where you can come up with different theories and explore different and different aspects is going to be a huge part of your success in in delivering um, distributed systems to your customers. So one of the things to to keep in mind. I hope that this was educational and helpful. Um, if y'all are interested in seeing me like come back and do another etcd episode, please just let me know in the chat, and I'll probably I'll probably do that. Um, Thanks so much for your time and hanging out with me on this beautiful Friday afternoon. And uh, y'all have a great weekend. Thank you so much for, for listening and, and being a part of this incredible community. So thank you very much. I'll see you next time.